Good evening and welcome to the regular public meeting of the Henry County Board of Commissioners for 6.30 p.m. Tuesday, April 17, 2012. At this time, I would invite you to join us for the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Commissioner Preston. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I would ask you to please be with us tonight as we make the, the decisions and provide the guidance that impacts so many in this beautiful community that we live in. Uh, we also like to thank you for our many blessings you've provided us with, but I also ask that you provide comfort for those that, that are currently in time of struggle and just need that comfort that you can provide. Specifically, I'd ask that you keep the Birch family in your thoughts and prayers. And um, Lord, just be with us as we are making these hard times and trying to, to do everything we can to help guide this county to better times. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, I'd like to call the meeting to order, and I'd like to make the following announcement. The following items will not be heard at this meeting. The first item is a request by Square One Property, Properties LLC of McDonough to amend the comprehensive plan for property located south of Mount Carmel Road, north and south of Bridges Road in Landlot 113 and 144 of the 6th District, and Landlots 128 and 129 of the 7th District. This has been tabled by the applicant. The second item is also a request by Square One Properties, and this is for a rezoning from C2 General Commercial to M1 Light Manufacturing. The property is also located south of Mount Carmel Road, north and south of Bridges Road in those same land lots. Additionally, the public hearing, a request by Pittsford Development LLC of Cumming, Georgia, to not modify a zoning condition for property located on the south side of Campground Road east of South Salem Drive in land lots 60 and 61 of the 7th District. The request is to modify a zoning condition regarding allowable fencing materials. This was tabled by staff. In addition to that, um, we also have a request by the Commissioner of District 3 to table item C under Planning and Zoning, which is a resolution requesting approval of an ordinance to amend Chapter 2, Zoning Districts, Table 2.03.03 .03 in Appendix A, the master list of acronyms and definitions and to create chapter four which is site design standards that item has also been requested to be tabled with those changes made to the agenda i would ask for an acceptance of the agenda Move to motion by mr stamey second by mr holmes all in favor motion carries five zero if you're here for any of those items that i just called um, if you will just um, watch the advertisements for the county meetings and watch for postings of the land, on the land, those items will be re-advertised for a future meeting. Moving on in the agenda, the first item is going to be a proclamation which we are going to present to the staff of Eagles Landing High School. And Chief Lacey, you are here and I'd like you to come up and say a few words before I read the proclamation. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I need to tell you this evening that the leading cause of death in this country for both men and women is cardiovascular disease and as a result heart attacks and, and strokes that result from that. 2,200 people per day in this country uh, die as a result of that. It's far too infrequent that we have a positive outcome uh, for that. But the American Heart Association tells us that the chain of survival for people who are having uh, a heart attack is essential to a positive outcome. Tonight we have a positive outcome and you're about to read a proclamation that, that expresses that uh, and, and how that occurred in, in our county. And what's absolutely essential for a positive outcome is the two first chain, links in the chain which deal with early recognition that there is a problem and early intervention by lay bystanders in terms of, of having uh, a positive outcome. We have a positive outcome uh, tonight to present uh, to you and it's, it's because those two links in that chain were, were extremely strong that we have a gentleman sitting here uh, tonight. 
and able to, um, to speak with you this evening. I'm going to invite uh, Captain Billy Conkel to come forward and give you some of the specifics about this uh, particular uh, call. Good evening. Uh, the morning of March 2nd, right around lunchtime, uh, Mr. Wortham was standing in the commons area of, the, uh, of Eagles Landing High School. We, we would typically know that as a lunchroom. But uh, he suddenly collapsed, and due to the quick actions of the faculty and staff members there, they were able to provide these links that Chief Lacey was just describing. They did have early recognition. They had early intervention, which was CPR. They were then able to gain access to an AED and, in fact, use an AED, the automatic external defibrillators, and deliver a shock to Mr. Wortham's body, which was then able to return a pulse and get his heart beating again. Our staff from the Henry County Fire Department arrived nine, which was probably nine very long minutes later, and we were able to transport him to Henry Medical Center, and he was then later flown to, um, to Eggleston Children's Hospital, uh, where he completed his recovery. Um, Mr. Eric Wortham, would you stand up for him? It is due to the actions of these, uh, these individuals that, that Mr. Wortham is able to stand here today and why we are requesting a proclamation in their honor. Well, I do have a proclamation and some certificates that we would like to present. And Chief Lacey, I'm going to hand you the certificates to present, and we would like to have a photograph after we read the proclamation. Okay. This is a proclamation in recognition of officials at Eagles Landing High School for the heroic act of saving a student's life. Whereas late last month at Eagles Landing High School in Stockbridge, student Eric Wortham, Jr. passed out during lunch in the cafeteria at the school, and whereas it was ascertained by school staff, including basketball coach Clay Krupp, assistant principal Richard Jacoby, assistant principal Al Kizzy, and staff member Juanita Larry, that the student was in serious need of emergency medical attention, at which time they immediately sprang into action. And whereas Mr. Jacoby began CPR on the unconscious student and Coach Crump, while holding the student's hand, ascertained that his heartbeat was faint and growing weaker. And whereas Principal Gabe Creary immediately called for the automated external defibrillator, while Coach Joe Technip was en route to the cafeteria with the device, and with expert precision, Technip shocked the young man back to life before paramedics arrived and in so doing was able to stabilize him with life-saving measures. Now therefore be it proclaimed that the Henry County Board of Commissioners wishes to extend its sincerest appreciation and gratitude to Gabe Creary, Clay Crump, Richard Jacoby, Al Kizzy, and Joe Technip, as well as staff members and officials at Eagles Landing High School for their quick thinking, fast actions, and grace under pressure, which resulted in saving student Eric Wortham Jr.'s life the 17th day of April 2012 by the Henry County Board of Commissioners. And if those um, outstanding individuals are here, we'd ask you to come forward for a certificate, and I think we definitely need to give you guys a round of applause.
right, we're going to move on in the agenda to purchasing. We have a resolution requesting authorization to purchase 10 Dodge Chargers for use by the police department. Our presenter, Rod Gray, purchasing director, Exhibit 7. This item was tabled at yesterday's meeting. And uh, after you got through with them, you should. <laughs> Major, Major Joe Jackson will be here to take the heat today. So uh, if you'd like to, to step up and. <laughs> Madam Chairman, Commissioners, I appreciate you allowing me to come in this afternoon for a few minutes. I'm here actually at the request of the county manager, Mr. Lella, and hopefully we can resolve any questions you may have for us today. But and I and I think it was it was somewhat explained yesterday. But the purpose of the resolution is to allow the county police department uh, to seek approval for the purchase of ten new vehicles utilizing federally seized funds. Uh, if they are approved, the vehicles will be the standard. Uh, issued 2012 Dodge Charger police vehicles, and they will be assigned to sworn personnel who work inside the Criminal Investigations Division at the Police Department. These are men and women who work for me. Uh, you allow me to be their uh, commander. Uh, the new vehicles would allow the division to deadline uh, 10 of the current vehicles that we have in the fleet uh, that, that are at least 10 years of age or uh, close to 150,000 miles or a combination thereof. Uh, we hope to purchase these vehicles from Aikens Ford Dodge Chrysler, uh, which is located in Winder, Georgia. Uh, they are under state contract, and, um, and these are, again, I, I would re recall that they are the standard V6 Dodge Charger. We're only asking for three um, miter extra items, a full-size tire, a vinyl rear seat, and um, a, the safety locks on the doors and windows because we do transport a number of prisoners. The cost of the extras are three hundred and sixty one dollars for the on addition in addition to the base car. I believe yesterday Mr. Holder had, had questioned uh, why why was the Dodge decided on? And I, I'll tell you quite frankly, if if Ford was still making the Crown Victoria, that would be my preference, but they, they no longer make that vehicle and we are looking and we've looked at other options. Um, we believe that the Ford, that the Dodge Charger is a trusted product. It's been in service for over a decade. Uh, I want to think that in around 2004, I saw the commissioner of the Georgia State Patrol driving the first one that the State Patrol tried out. Um, it's a tested product. Uh, we believe it will improve on the overall reliance of our fleet and hopefully add in fuel efficiency for the times that we're now in. In addition, we have a local recommendation. Uh, Chief Preston Dorsey from the McDonald Police Department had recommended this same vehicle to our Chief Nichols. We believe that, uh, that, that there's some officer safety that will assist in buying this Dodge Charger. They are rear wheel vehicle, rear wheel drive vehicles. Officers in Georgia are currently trained at the mandate schools driving rear wheel vehicles and there would be no need to retrain or change the driving habits that are uh, officers now have. And a, and a third reason that we would like to go with the Dodges is, is the uniformity of the vehicles of which our agency would hope to be purchasing in the future in addition to these. Uh, prior to the most recent budgetary restraints, I spoke with our uniform commander, Major Mark Ammerman, and I talked to him because they, they have the need for a large number of vehicles every year. And we also talked with Mr. Jody Swords, our uh, maintenance division for our vehicles. And I spoke with each of them and Major Ammerman hopes in the future when times are better that he will be able to transition his fleet uh, to the Chargers and that uh, when we talked with Mr. Sword, he said he didn't have a, a firm feeling for what type vehicle we would get. He could work on all of them as long as we had uh, sufficient stock of parts and the easiest way for us to do that was to all have the same type of vehicle. The vehicles that we would be asking for are the same that our uniform patrol would be uh, asking for without the lettering on them. Um, these vehicles would be, all of them would be assigned to detectives who investigate crimes here in the county. And uh, it, this is just a necessary part of their job. Um, the position in CID requ requires them to be on call, to be called out uh, at all hours of the night and day. And hopefully these newer vehicles will ensure that they can meet the requirements of the job in a safe and efficient manner. Um, I, I don't know, were you, were you planning on addressing the, uh, 
the bid? The yes. Okay, yes. Uh, is there any questions that I could possibly answer for you? Any board member have a question? Mr. Preston? I know we asked yesterday because there was also, I think, y'all were going to find out the difference between the warranties between the, the Dodges and the Fords because I think the Dodge is better, isn't it? Okay. Can you address that, Mike? Uh, the warranties on the... I don't, okay. I don't have any then information never mind on that. If it's... Let's see here. Uh, I also did a little homework on this thing, too, because I couldn't figure out why that car was not, not you know, I guess nobody else bid it on it. We had other other dealers in the area, but the way the state does, they only only award that contract to one manufacturer of, of different cars, and this was awarded to Aiken, and I even talked to a couple of people at Landmark, and they couldn't even come close because there's no very little markup in this car, and I mean, it's like a $300 deal for them, period. Yes, they're, just, they're just simply doing it. It is, it is a negotiated deal that the state of Georgia finds a dealer along with a manufacturer to, to award this contract to, and it's, it's good for one year. And yesterday was the 10 days. There was 10 days out to order these cars. I think today we're looking at nine. Tomorrow will be eight. But the order needs to be placed pretty quick because the time to, to receive this, this will be a 12 car. You'll be into the 13 model year, right? Yes, sir. I believe so. We actually got quotes from two different dealerships, um, Landmark and Chronic, and neither one of those dealerships were able to match the state contract price as of, as of now, basically because of the deadline and not having any in on. Yeah, they could get within $600 I talked to, especially with the extras you had on this car. But uh, if you would, please order one of Hemi because Mr. Bowman's going to want a Hemi in one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Commissioner Stamey. Uh, no, I would like to take this opportunity to apologize to the board, and uh, I would apologize to Mr. Gray, but he's not here. I've done it already. I did it yesterday, but just because we're still talking about the cars. Uh, when I was reading it, I kind of looked at it, and I, 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 I'm going to just say that I had a senior moment because I kept looking, and I seen the 370 horsepower Hemi's in there, and I had some issues with that. But uh, and also, the, I want the, the uh, county manager and I—he just gave me the signal, by the way. But we've come up with a signal, so when I'm fixing to stick my foot in my mouth, you won't be able to see it, but I'll be able to see it, and uh, we'll do it from there. But uh, I, I do appreciate it, and and I did. I, honest to goodness, I got confused. I, I couldn't. I couldn't make the numbers work in my head for some reason, and I'm, I'm pretty much a numbers guy. But uh, anyhow, I'm glad that we're making that. I'm glad we're making the move because, you know, Crown Vicks are not there. And uh, with that being said, Madam Chair, when you call for a motion, I would like to make it since how I made a fool out of myself yesterday. Are there any more questions <laughs> before I call for a motion? All right, Mr. Bowman, I'll look yeah, to you. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the purchase of the Tim Dodge Chargers without the Hemi engines. No, don't put that in <laughs> the Tim Dodge Chargers. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Bowman and a second by Mr. Holder. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you for your, Thank your you. continuous you, you got out easy today. Yeah, <laughs> but, but at least I showed up. <laughs> Moving on to planning and zoning services, we have a presentation of the Livable Centers Initiative Supplemental Study, the Hudson Bridge Road, Jonesboro Road Feasibility Study. Our presenter is Sherry Hobson Matthews, Director <coughs> of Planning and Zoning, Exhibit Number 15. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair and Board Members. Um, I certainly won't take up a lot of time because I want to spend most of the presentation um, with the consultants. But in February of last year, um, the Atlanta Regional Commission awarded Henry County a $50,000 um, LCI supplemental study as a result of our LCI study um, that was completed t um, two years prior. Um, as a result of that study, one recommendation on the transportation side was to study the feasibility of a parallel connector along I-75, um, similar to what we have at Patrick Henry Parkway. Um, the county was successful in securing um, a consultant team, JB plus A, in conjunction with McGee Partners, and they are here t um, this evening to present their findings. Um, this is simply for informational purposes only. We will um, forward the scoping report to the Atlanta Re Regional Commission for final approval, and then I will bring it back to the board for final adoption. Um, this evening, I am pleased to have John Fish, who was the project manager representing JB plus A, and Tommy Crochet, who is representing McGee Partners. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask either myself, um, Tommy, John, or any of the other representatives here. 
I do certainly want to also recognize that um, the Georgia Department of Transportation District 3 office was very instrumental in participating in all of our staff meetings and there are representatives here tonight um, to represent GDOT. Thank you. Good evening. Sherry. Good evening, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, my name is John Fish, as Sherry indicated. I'm a Director of Community Planning with JB Plus A. We are partnered in this project with uh, McGee Partners and Tommy Crochet, who is the president of that organization, is with me tonight. And we're going to try to give you a brief overview of the feasibility study for the uh, Western Parallel Connector Project. <clears throat> um, let me start by talking a little bit about the scoping study and remind you that this is an ARC Livable Centers initiative, so it's jointly funded 50-50 um, with uh, ARC. And the purpose of these feasibility studies or scoping studies is identified on the, on the top of the slide there. Basically, it allows them to validate that you have a viable project, that you have realistic cost information, that you have logical termini for the project. And this, of course, um, once adopted by ARC, positions the project and, and you all to receive future additional funding through ARC's transportation <coughs> project program. Now, um, in our interaction with some of the folks in the community, there's been some concern that this is uh, a final uh, step in the process. And in reality, this is very much a preliminary or first step in the process. This really is just um, teeing up the project, if you will, and positioning the project and, and uh, the county to receive future funding. Um, the scoping study requires uh, that we identify a need and purpose statement, and as you all are well aware, this project really has a twofold uh, need and purpose statement. The first is transportation related, and the second is economic development related. So the transportation component, of course, is the notion of enhancing, improving the north-south circulation internal to the county uh, between uh, Jonesboro Road and Hudson Bridge Road. And the second, of course, is providing valuable infrastructure which uh, will assist this portion of the county, which is remarkably undeveloped at this moment, uh, in, in continuing to uh, grow, develop, and uh, generate new tax base. Just a refresher for the uh, project uh, limits. Uh, you'll remember perhaps the shape on the right as being the study area from the original uh, Hudson Bridge, Jonesboro Road, LCI study. This road project was central to that initial LCI project and is one of the action items that came out of that initial project, the other being the overlay uh, ordinance conversation that is ongoing. This project is about a 3.3 million, sorry, 3.3 mile uh, project running north-south from uh, Jonesboro Road through the Jodico Road area and then up to the Hudson Bridge. Um, and I think that's probably a good spot to stop. Tommy? As part of our study, one of the first things we dealt with was to see what, what kind of environmental constraints might we have in this corridor that would help drive how we should uh, prepare the alignment for the roadway. Primarily what we found in this corridor are, are two very large floodplains on the south end just above Jonesboro Road is Walnut Creek and its floodplains. Uh, in this area. Then on the north end uh, is Pates Creek, which is a much bigger floodplain uh, and has a lot of associated wetlands uh, and streams associated with that floodplain. Uh, we did locate one cemetery uh, on the Mount Olive uh, Baptist Church property and some graves that are very close to the existing Mount Olive Road alignment are, are another concern of ours. We looked at typical sections. I'm not going to go into any great detail, but basically what we're looking at here is a four-lane roadway uh, eventually separated by a raised median along with a 10-foot uh, multi-use path on the west side of the roadway and a 5-foot sidewalk on the east side of the roadway. Um, knowing the financial constraints we're in in these days to build transportation projects, 
Uh, we're, we're assuming that you will likely only be able to afford to build two lanes initially along with the multi-use uh, path. Uh, so we've developed cost estimates for, for both just building two lanes initially as well as what it would take to build the four lanes, uh, the complete project at this time. Uh, back in December, we had our first uh, community meeting as well as getting together with our technical advisory committee, and we presented several different alignments. Uh, most of these were identified in the previous LCI study. Uh, we did add, add a couple. We got input um, from the community at that meeting, and at that same time, we had our, our first round of meetings with uh, some of the individual property owners. Then in, then in February, uh, we came back after getting those comments from the community as well as the, the large property owners who are directly affected with this uh, proposed roadway. And we went back out in February and presented what we're calling our preferred alignment at this time. Now, this is what we're recommending in the study, but we believe there's still work to do. As you move forward with the project and, and you've got what funding you know you have in hand, as we negotiate with some of these individual property owners, there's still room for adjustments to, to make the project more feasible and as well as to make it uh, better for the development of each of these individual properties in the future. I'll give you a quick rundown on some of this and, and who we talked to. Uh, on the south end of the project, we did talk to the Inland Western folks who are managing the, the large shopping center there. Uh, really nothing big to speak of there since we're really just skirting the edge of their property and they were, were pleased with that. We did meet with McDonough Christian Church uh, a, a couple of times, got some of their concerns. Uh, uh, we believe we have some of their concerns addressed in our proposed layout. Um, we do anticipate that a signal would be warranted at Jonesboro Road, at the intersection with the connector in Jonesboro Road, as well as we were able to develop uh, some, some joint use access and to provide good connectivity uh, across their property in this area. We're actually going to preserve a, a section of the existing Mount Olive Road in here, which will provide a frontage road to connect some of uh, the church's own driveways to each other while still having a, you know, a main point of, of connection with the roadway that lines up with the, uh, the back driveway to Inland Western's parcel. Uh, we also met with the Morris family, uh, who owns this kind of L-shaped track around the church. And in, in, in talking with them, we're looking at, at probably a joint use driveway in this area as well, which will be very helpful. As we go further down, we met with the Mount Olive Baptist Church, uh, the pastor there, and, and, and got some of his concerns, and, and we believe we've addressed what his concerns are with this property. We are going to be staying, for the most part, off of the Mount Olive Church property, primarily because uh, we don't want to have any impacts whatsoever with the cemetery or any of the graves that are out there. We did get some concern uh, from some of the residents in the Morgan's Pond subdivision up here. Uh, they were hopeful that we could push the road alignment further away from their property, the concern, I guess, with, with noise or, or visual impacts. However, we really can't push it any further than we've got here without getting into very extensive wetland impacts and, and making the impacts to the floodplain uh, more extensive and, and which would raise the cost of the project. We also met with Dr. Chin, who owns property on the east side of, of the connector, as well as this large 1,200-acre tract here south of Jonesboro Road. Uh, and of course, you all are aware that you know, there has been talk in, in previous proposals for putting a regional mall on this property. Um, Dr. Chin did, did feel like the alignment we're showing is probably, probably most conducive to uh, being able to develop this area as a regional mall in the future. Um, then as, as we cross uh, Jodico Road, uh, we did have a conversation with the Cook family and, and made them aware of what was going on. We had several, a uh, couple of meetings with the folks uh, with this Jodico I-75 property. Um, we went back and forth on some issues with some alignments. Um, and at this time, we're probably not in agreement with their desires for the alignment here. But uh, as I said earlier, we do anticipate as we begin, as funding is identified and you're able to move forward with the project, and then, then we can get into negotiations in, in earnest with these property owners to finalize these alignments. Um, and in doing so, uh, we need to be concerned with impacts to these other, other properties 
you know, what, what may be good for one property owner may not be good for another property owner. We've got to be able to balance that along with the cost of actually building the road. And so that's a concern. One of their requests was to raise the road so it's even at the same elevation as I-75. And we believe this would add at least a million and a half dollars to the cost of the road project, which would have to be borne by the, the county. So we were a little reluctant to commit to that. North of this area is, is uh, IKRK Holdings. And we met with the Justice family a couple of times on this and worked with them. Um, they were very supportive of us changing the alignment. The original alignment in the LCI study would have crossed the floodplain west of the large lake that's on their property. And, and when we looked at issues in crossing the floodplain, we felt it best that we cross as close to I-75 as we can. And, and they indicated that they were happier with this alignment. It allowed them to do a better job with developing their property in the future. Uh, we then met with uh, Lyman Stringer Track uh, along with some of his partners and, and worked through that, made a couple of little tweaks to the alignment, made a couple of tweaks to the, to the road elevation, and, and we believe we're in a good agreement with them on that. Cost, of course, that's the big issue here. Uh, as we looked at the two-lane section version, uh, we're looking at about $29 million. Now, that includes doing streetscaping and landscaping along there, street lighting, it includes the multi-use path, but it is only building the, the initial two lanes. If you would find a good pot of money, then you would you'd be looking at about $44 million to build the full four-lane section for the entire uh, roughly 3.3 miles from Jonesboro up to Hudson Bridge Road. Okay. Thanks, Tommy. Um, so as Tommy has indicated, as part of this process, we did um, conduct uh, two community meetings. Um, one in December and one in February, and we had good participation at, at both of those meetings. Um, we also have had a good interaction with most of the property owners that are involved or, or would be impacted by the project along the quarter. And uh, as Tommy has indicated, I think most of the property owners are generally comfortable. Some have some specific concerns. Uh, that can be uh, ironed out uh, in the next phases of the design process. But I did want to make the point just that, it, particularly in this day and age of, of difficult budgets, that uh, for this project particularly, it's important that the property owners be partners with the county in this process. And, and I think um, hopefully we've started that collaboration and, and uh, that process can continue uh, going forward and we can find the win-win solutions for, for all parties involved. Um, just want to go back and kind of um, revisit the LCI and, and share how this um, uh, current alignment uh, relates to that original work that was done uh, with that original LCI. This diagram shows the original LCI framework plan that was prepared and then the red line uh, running through the center, center of the plan shows the current alignment. So it's, very, it's generally very similar to the road alignment that was proposed in the original LCI framework plan, uh, diverging primarily, uh, as Tommy indicated, uh, north at the Pates Creek floodplain. Um, so the alignment is similar. This, the typical section that was proposed in the original LCI is shown in the lower left that shows a four-lane divided parkway with multi-use trail and sidewalk and a very similar 115 foot or thereabouts uh, wide right away. The original LCI also talks about design speed and the design speed recommended in the original LCI was a 35 to 45 mile per hour uh, design speed. The road as currently planned is at a 45 mile per hour design speed. And a, a big reason for that is, is we're, we do project over 30,000 vehicles a day on this road uh, in the next, you know, after about 20 years. And, and really with that kind of volume, you want to be dealing with uh, just a little bit faster design speed. Miles reached on that because I know some of the, the folks that are interested in retail development along that corridor do not want cars passing through their development at 45 miles an hour. It's not really conducive, nor is it safe for pedestrians to walk along roadways where the speed limit is 45 miles an hour. 
Well, absolutely. There is flex, there's flexibility in the design speed. The challenge here is balancing those two needs, is the, the need of moving the traffic efficiently through, through the corridor um, and offset with the desire to move pedestrians and other users along the corridor. Um, let's just go back one. What, what this diagram is showing is um, the idea that the original LCI had was the series of growth centers. And so those, as I understood the concept, those, the idea was that those would be more densely developed sort of urbanist uh, communities linked by the spine that is the, the proposed connector. So there is the ability to move north-south safely from a pedestrian point of view, but those blocks, if you will, on the, on the uh, parkway are going to be fairly long. The median breaks will typically be a minimum of, what, six or 700 feet. Um, so I, I think it's possible to move along the parkway. It may not be as pedestrian friendly in terms of a kind of urban grid, but I think you will have that urban character in those growth centers, which are the kind of walkable areas within the corridor. Um, Stop you right there, 172. Sure. Echo some of the same thoughts that she had earlier, the chairman did. Um, the theory behind this concept would slide the buildings closer to the road, correct? The, some of the commercial development would be slid closer to the road, more of Atlantic, Atlantic, Atlantic Station type feel, correct? Yes, I think that's true. And I think, if, and I, unfortunately, I took the slide out that shows some of those detailed plans, but um, I think most of that sort of pedestrian friendly. Um, new urbanist design occurs in those uh, core areas. So that, that frontage on those internal grid roads, as the diagram on the right is showing, can still happen. Uh, I just think it, it would be a lot more friendly or shopping atmosphere, especially in the areas that's going to be heavily developed, to be no more than 35 miles an hour. I mean, 45 miles an hour with, with those buildings slid closer to the road, I'm sure a lot of those are going to be restaurants through there. And I, I think that's pretty fast for that type of environment. And I also wanted to <clears throat> inquire when the traffic ch counts were being done as part of the, the study, did that take into consideration? Because we know we have I-75, which virtually is a parking lot most of the time. Right. Um, there are some plans to, of course, improve Highway 42. And this was also going to operate as um, a means of keeping people off of I-75 for their trips just between the short trips between interchanges. When the traffic counts were done, did it take into consideration the uh, reversible managed lanes that are slated for I-75? Was that put in as part of the modeling? When it, when it was. We basically use ARC's travel demand model, which which did include the managed lanes. Uh, as part of the model at that time. So we did see when we, when we compared the model without the connector to the model with the connector, we did see uh, three to five to 6,000 vehicles coming off of I-75 and actually going on the connector. And again, I, I guess I would make two points. One is this is still preliminary, so it, it, can, be, it can be ultimately designed with a slower design speed if that's uh, something that's a priority for, for you all. Um, it could also be posted at a lower design speed, but that creates some challenges on the enforcement side. That's, that's one of the big concerns with that is, is that um, it, it may be very difficult to get certification for you to run radar on this type of road from GDOT at 35 miles an hour, and that, that needs to be weighed in on this because whatever, whatever speed you post it at, you want to be able to enforce it. Well, I know. Um you know, we, we always have to keep in mind how we can best move traffic in and out of the county. However, this particular area presents a unique opportunity that no other area in the county presents, and that's an opportunity to have a true livable centers um, uh, located here, um, you know, in, in keeping with our goals for our comprehensive land use plan and as an employment center. It just is something that is, that is unique to have that much acreage available to really design and craft a true livable a live work and place center that we want to have here in Henry County and I want to make sure that we don't mess that up by creating a racetrack through the area because if you get speeds that are not compatible with pedestrian activity and things of that nature you, you're not going to be able to create the environment that you want to create. To, to be able to uh, institute a road that would, would operate you know reasonably at a 35 miles an hour 
we would have to integrate in geometric constraints into the alignment. Tighter curves, uh, sharper profiles and, and some of that, which on this alignment in some areas, that makes sense. In other areas, we're not going to be able to get them in and you will have the situation, even though you post it for 35, they will be going faster. In this particular corridor, with, with some of what we're hearing on how they want to develop some of the properties, from that standpoint and the terrain we're working with, it just, it just fits better naturally from that geometric perspective with a 45 mile an hour design. And if you just artificially go slap a 35 mile an hour speed limit sign on something that it's more naturally can be traveled at 45, uh, you're going to have problems uh, in that respect. We likely would not be able to get it certified by GDOT torn radar on it, and you would have difficulty enforcing it. And so as we were balancing those kind of issues, <clears throat> from the planning perspective, they saw more that, especially in the larger tracks, that the internal streets can provide that tight funding, you know, that, that tight uh, with, with the buildings closer to the right-of-way and that kind of feel. I would echo your observation that this is a unique opportunity for the county, and it, it is sort of remarkable that there is this kind of acreage in Henry County right next to the interstate still available for development. So it is an opportunity to do something different than what Henry County has been doing. So I, I applaud you for that. I would also observe you, you mentioned that some of your property owners are interested in doing a different style of development and that when the county goes back to negotiate with those folks uh, on the right of way that certainly the, the plan will have to be adjusted to meet their needs and that goes back to that partnership conversation we were having earlier. So, uh, I think that's really wraps it up. I think we just go one more and really just wanted to say that you know that clearly the opportunity exists to to have a parkway like feel along the corridor and that that um, parkway can um, be a complete street and can accommodate the multi-use trail as we've talked about the sidewalk and provide for safe uh, crossings and uh, at safe yeah safe crossings at each and all of the intersections so that really concludes the presentation Happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Is any board member, Mr. Holder? Okay. Looking at the travel lane, it's two, two 11 foot travel lanes, correct? Yes, yes sir. sir. What is the typical, and I'm going to defer to Mr. McNichol, in Henry County, what is the typical subdivision street, the travel lanes? 22 feet? Yes. Okay, we're talking about a road here that's going to carry 30,000 cars a day with two 11-foot travel lanes that are curved and gutted. So in other words, if, if how does this meet with emergency services, emergency vehicles, because you're going to have to either get over a curb or get away because you held within those curbs and it's 22 feet. Is that taken into consideration? Oh, absolutely. Uh, okay. 20, 20, 22 feet for this type of roadway is, is pretty much the standard okay. now. Like a subdivision street. No wider, no nothing, no more than a subdivision street that the requirements of Henry County today. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and I understand it's curved and gutted. But I know if you've got some GDOT people out there, GDOT will not, uh, will not assist the county in anything less than an 80-foot right-of-way. Granted, that's not curved and gutted. But at least if you have something other than a curved and gutted street, which I think it needs to be curved and gutted, don't get me wrong, you're going to have to have a shoulder or somewhere f for disabled vehicles or whatever to get off the road. In this one, you see the whole thing is put on a 60-foot right-of-way, even with the multi-use path. Is that correct for the single-lane traffic? Well, we're, initially what's going to happen is, is uh, as the county acquires the property, even though they might only build two lanes, they would inquire the entire 115 feet of right-of-way so that they that, have the right-of-way set aside. But that's not my point. Where there's a, in your typical section, you're mm -hmm. showing a two-lane road, yeah. and on the left you're showing the multi-use path and a total of 60 feet of right-of-way. A 22-foot of pavement will provide 
uh, according to the AASHTO standards, which are the standards we design roads by, is uh, very acceptable for this type of roadway. We see this roadway as a collector roadway. It will allow, you know, emergency vehicles to go around a stall vehicle okay. in those situations. So we are very comfortable on that end, okay. 22 feet. What the 22 feet also does, besides reducing cost a little bit, it does provide somewhat of a traffic calming. So if it is designed for 45, the vehicles will tend to go around 45 instead of speeding 10 miles an hour over the speed. Thank you for making that comment because it means that it's not as safe if they can't get around, correct? Because they don't have the room to get around. Is it more or less safe? It's, it's safer. If Coach, the trucks can't safe. move, then it's very safe. Obviously, if there's an accident that's blocking the road, okay. then you have to deal with that. Uh, most accidents will block one lane, and then you have to deal with, with getting around. I got you. I have no further questions. Any other board member with a question? Okay. This is not really a public hearing. This is for informational purposes only, but we did have two individuals that I want to recognize that had signed up and asked to speak in reference to this. And the first one is Pastor Paul Leslie, senior of the McDonough Christian Church. And he wants to speak about Mount Olive Road. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Board of Commissioners. It's good to be with you all tonight. First, let me applaud you for being proactive in considering a project like this. Uh, it is long overdue. Uh, we have uh, had McDonough Christian Church at the corner of Mount Olive and Jonesboro Road since 1991. And we all know that there have been a lot of changes in that area. Uh, the reason I'm here tonight is for several reasons. I'm going to defer to the chairman of our board and let him make the primary presentation. But we just want to be proactive in this endeavor. Uh, we believe it's well needed. Uh, anything we can do to encourage the traffic flow to get our people safely to and from McDonough Christian Church will be an absolute blessing. If it's a two-lane proposal, my question would be, would that be the east lanes or the west lanes? Uh, and if the road right away is all obtained, that's going to take out a large percentage of our existing parking. I know all that will be taken care of and negotiated down the road. If it is a four lane that's approved, uh, motorists coming from the Lovejoy area, Chambers Road, Mount Carmel Road, would have to do a U-turn on Jonesboro Road to enter our property or turn down Mount Olive Road and do a, a U-turn on Mount Olive or turn into our office parking lot, which does not connect currently to our church parking lot. And so albeit it'll be great, you put 30,000 cars on that road, we've already been handicapped because of the growth of the county, getting our people safely on and off our property. So I'm just here tonight to say, hey, let's think forward, let's be very positive. We are a, po a positive partner, as John said. We want to work with the county. We want to see improvement. Uh, but I think we even may need to consider a red light at the town center, uh, the, the Mount Olive exit and entrance to that shopping center, and work with the Morris family and see what we could do on that. A couple of things that are just points of interest when we talk about speeds on Mount Olive Road. Uh, if you're on Jonesboro Road, there's some signs that say slow church zone 35 miles an hour. But the speed limit posted on the paved part of Mount Olive Road is 45 miles an hour which is only the part which is adjacent to our church property. So that's just a little bit of humor, uh, something you may not realize. One other thing is we're trying to improve Henry County. Um, if you're pulling a camper or a fifth wheeler or a motor coach and you're coming north on I-75 and you want to get to the campground on Jodico Road and you put in your GPS, it will tell you to get off at Jonesboro Road and come down Mount Olive Road. And uh, I, I'm excited this is going to be improved because we have had a lot of people who are guests to our county who have gotten in a real pickle trying to make the turn on Mount Olive Road. So I'm going to defer the rest of my time. Thank you all. We're excited about this project. I hope it can happen. Uh, and we'll do anything we can as, to support the Board of Commissioners and uh, partner with you all in this endeavor. And I'm going to defer the rest of my time. Thank you all very much. Thank you. All right. And the second gentleman that signed up, Mike Thomas, is that your... Is this your board director? Okay. okay. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. Paul mentioned most of the things I wanted to mention to you, but we believe it's best for us to be heard early and to be heard often in order for our concerns to be addressed. As Henry County has developed, our church has been significantly impacted. Paul mentioned we moved there in 1991. It was just us in the woods and a few farms out there, and obviously now that's not the case. 
uh, and the, many of the improvements that have been made have already impacted the access to our church. As Paul mentioned, we can no longer enter by um, coming from the east side on Jonesboro Road. We have to go down to Mount Olive Road. Our concern is is that with a raised median, if our uh, members were forced to the back of the property, they would have to make a U-turn. We could not use that office entrance to get to the church as it's presently configured. So we just want to make sure the commissioners and the consultants were aware of our concerns for access because they seem to be um, becoming less and less desirable as development occurs around the church. We do appreciate, again, the opportunity to speak, the opportunity to meet with your consultants, and just hope that you would consider those things in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Holder, are you, uh, were you on the board when they closed Mount Olive Road to the campground? Probably. When did they close it? <laughs> I think the bridge washed out is the reason. 2004, okay. 2004, yeah, I was here. Yeah, I, I could see how a camper would have trouble getting there from uh, Jonesboro Road. But we definitely appreciate your comments, and we certainly um, want to partner and work with you as well. Um, we value the service that your church provides to our community, all of our churches, and um, we, we want to be a good partner with you as well. So we will do everything we can to make this work for you too. But thank you for your comments. All right, if there's no other comments or questions from the board on this item, we're going to move on to a public hearing. And this is a request by the Taylor's Landing at Spivey Homeowners Association of Stockbridge, Georgia, to modify a zoning condition for property located on Landlot 42 of the 12th District. The request is to modify a zoning condition regarding a 20-foot undisturbed buffer. Our presenter is Sherry Hobson Matthews, Director of Planning and Zoning, and that's Exhibit Number 16. Good evening again. Good evening, Madam Chair and Board Members. Um, the request before you this evening, as Chairman Mathis has indicated, is a modification to a zoning condition um, which was placed on this subdivision at the time of um, rezoning. Um, the property was rezoned in 2005, and at that time, 12 zoning conditions were placed on the property. The property owners are here this evening to request, um, their request was to modify the actual condition, which currently reads, there shall be a 20-foot undisturbed buffer along the perimeter of the property. In speaking with um, a number of the property owners within the subdivision, um, their concern is that they wanted to erect privacy fences or, or erect a privacy fence, but they're unable to do that with this um, zoning condition that's currently in place. Um, staff has reviewed our Unified Land Development Code and found that there is no regulations in today's current ordinance that would require um, a 20-foot buffer where residential abuts residentially zoned property. Um, so staff has recommended rather than amending um, the zoning condition as requested by the property owners that the request just be eliminated in its entirety as it would not violate any codes that are currently on the books. Um, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Does any board member have a question or comment pertaining to this item? Uh, Mr. Preston? I was just impressed. It looked like the, the homeowners had really, I mean, the letter of intent pretty much had a lot of participation, which makes this obviously much easier to consider and then seeing the staff recommendations all aligned, this this makes this a much easier decision to make a recommendation for. Well, since this is a public hearing, I want to ask if there's anyone who is in opposition to the applicant's request, if you are opposed to the to the buffer being removed, not in favor but opposed, you're against it. Is, okay, if you would step to the uh, microphone, please, and state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Madam Chair and all of the board members. I am Kimberly Newsom. This is my husband, Timothy Newsom. We are at 7968 Spivey Road. I also have with me Ms. Simpson and Ms. Gresham, and they can give you their address. 7964 Spivey Road. 7944 Spivey Road. We would like to say the executive summary filed by Mr. Dion Reed basically identifies that the adjoining properties are compatible and that the current buffer does not provide the same privacy as a privacy fence. Please be aware that within the 20-foot undisturbed buffer, there is a 30-foot undisturbed water quality buffer noted on the plat. If the request is approved, it, remo it <coughs> will remove a total of 50 feet and not 20 feet, as the executive summary has noted. 
Additionally, the executive summary under criteria point five does not address the full impact this would have upon adjacent property owners should the request be approved. Per the general notes made on the site layout plans, the purpose of the buffer was not for privacy, but to minimize the rate of storm water traveling from this site onto the neighboring properties. It is our belief the executive summary has failed to include or discuss the drainage of flooding concerns of its adjoining neighbors. It also failed to include other sections of the Unified Land Development Code, such as Section 5.00.01, which states in part that it is the intent of the county to reduce the adverse visual environment and aesthetic effects of development in order to minimize the rate of stormwater runoff and to maximize the capability of groundwater recharge in urban or suburban areas. Additionally, Section 5.02.01 states in part that the intent of these requirements shall be to enhance the visual and aesthetic appearance of the county. The purpose of these buffer requirements is to, on Part C, reduce the impact of development on the drainage system and reduce flooding. We are here to make you aware that when there is a storm, the storm water from the site is not diverted and flows directly into the neighboring yards, thus causing major flooding in our front and backyards. Without the buffer, our, pro our properties will get much more water and flooding and possibly affect our property foundations. There is a retention pond located on the northeast corner of the site. However, it does not appear that the storm water is being directed to this designated area. The excess storm water from the site is encumbering our, proper, our properties on Spivey Road. Um, as a result, we respectfully request that the buffers not be removed until a proper drainage system to direct the flow of the excess storm water from the site is corrected. And also, I'm not um, computer savvy, but we have pictures to show some of our um, the flooding in our properties when it rains. Or you have photos. We have it on a phone. <clears throat> on a phone. Oh. Mm -hmm. If we can show it to you. The buffer is on uh, Tyler. Uh, Taylor. The, okay. the, the buffer would be on all of the 15 property owners that are part of Taylor's Landing subdivision. Okay. Mm -hmm. But that subdivision is adjacent to our following properties, so the water drains from their properties down to ours. We have a creek. We have a creek also that's across from us. Now we're getting so much storm water runoff that that creek next to us is like a river. Just from the water coming down, it needs to be diverted because we have a drain also in our front yard that sends water to the creek. But that's, the, that's just like a minimum amount of water. Like if it rains or something, groundwater, got to take it to the creek. But what's happening now, it's a ton of water coming, still still filling water. that creek up. Still more than one Let me ask y'all something. What is the zoning of y'all's property today? Are, are y'all RA? Yes. Yes, they are. So residential agricultural. So it's residential going against, residential RA going against, uh, is Taylor Landing R2? They are R2, but when the Unified Land Development Code was adopted, their property actually converted to R3, but retained all of the development standards. So they were rezoned for R2, which is single family residential. Taylor. And how many homes are in Taylor right now? 15. 15 all hit this buffer or 15 in the whole entire subdivision? It's 15 total lots in the subdivision. Have you contacted the county about the, the uh, runoff issue? Have you talked? Have you spoken to anyone? I think Ms. Simpson probably has. I called one day to talk to someone, you know. They said, they told me at that time that something going on in the ditch. They came up and they uh, cleaned out the ditch, but that didn't do anything. It's coming from that subdivision. Okay. Can you point on, on the map where you are? Yeah, if you would, if you would, uh, yeah, yeah, that way everyone can see.
Can you do it on that? Yeah, you'll have yeah, to lay it. If you'll lay it down, yeah, we'll, be, we'll all pictures. be able to see it on the screen. Right there. No. no, right in front. Sherry, use that plan. To show. But that's the best we can do. Show. I would like to see the map. If you guys you want to see, see, see the map. Yeah, much better. Okay. Seven nights is supposed to buy the road. It's here. Okay, I saw it. It's here. Ronaldo and Sarah, but that's innocence, and I think when they wrote it up, they wrote it up wrong. That's our property. This property, Miss Gresham, right here, this is her property. Back here is Miss Newsom. She's on the other side of us. And show them where the water's flowing. For some kind of, for some reason, when it rains, this water, these people's driveway is right here. There's another driveway here. The water come down through here, gathers up, come on down, and end up coming across in this direction, coming down here, hitting us, and going down here. Where was that? There, right in here is, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just going right to say. Right in here. Okay. The, the uh, retention pond is here. For some reason, this water, right, it's a little hill or something here. This water is not coming here, gathering up, and instead of going here and going down to the retention pond, it's just coming back down through us. Yeah. In that picture y'all showed, though, where was where if the person was standing when you took that picture? Where is In that? Where would you be? Where were you at your property? At her house. Mm -hmm. Point right there. Where you took that picture? Probably coming right there. Right in here. Okay. Well, that water is coming down, coming down through here. So, are you saying that the buffer, the current buffer, reduces the amount of water that comes down to your property? It reduces it a little bit, still not a lot. Not Because we're still getting flooding. So, now if they remove it, we're going to get more flooding. It's in the backyard and the front yard. Sure. Why, why do they want to remove it? My understanding is that the property owners want to be able to erect privacy fences on their properties. Um, and because the buffer is in place, um, they're not able to disturb any of the landscaping that's there now. But I do want to clarify that the only request that's before you all is the removal of the 20-foot buffer. Um, the 30-foot water quality critical buffer was not listed as a zoning condition, nor is that part of the request that you're hearing tonight. Um, me not being really versed in stormwater, but, and I certainly will defer to the experts, um, but it appears that this may be more of a stormwater issue because it doesn't appear that the water is being conveyed to the detention pond. So that means that something is blocking it. So I don't know that the 20-foot buffer is the cause being there or not being there to, to take care of their problem. So we most certainly, this is my first time hearing it tonight, and we have the right people here to get their information and see if we can get some follow-up with of our stormwater department yeah, on we that. We definitely need stormwater to go but out. But the 30-foot buffer is on this plat, and it lies in front of the 20-foot buffer. There is a 30-foot water quality critical buffer, but that was not part of the zoning conditions. So the request tonight is only to remove the 20-foot buffer. Um, we certainly will have to work with our stormwater department and our environmental compliance department to determine um, why that 30-foot water quality buffer is there and if that is something that can be disturbed. So is it 30-foot plus 20 There's or it's 30-foot total and that includes the 20? 30 plus 20. So it's 50, it's 50 all together? Yes, ma'am. And these are R3 lots? They are zoned R2, but when the zoning ordinance was amended in 2009, they were actually converted to R3. But they meet all of the R2, as you would have remembered them, standards. And if you would recall, they actually came in to be rezoned for R3. The board denied the R3 and approved the R2, given the character of the area and given the surrounding properties. That yeah, would and be I think the, the buffer was put in specifically for the um, RA properties that adjoin that. If I remember correctly, <coughs> that was the purpose for that for that buffer. Mr. Holder, Sherry, as far as the 30-foot drainage, for lack of a better term, 
I know it's a buffer, but it's like a drainage easement, and the 20-foot undisturbed buffer. If the 20-foot undisturbed buffer is across on the other side of the undisturbed uh, of the drainage buffer, it can't be touched anyhow. That's exactly right. Because the drainage easement has to trump any other restrictions or any other buffer. Why? Because water doesn't know. Water's going downhill. And when you said that it's coming down to you, the good Lord has shown you where the low part is, and he's going to put the water there. So nobody can do anything to take away a drainage easement or a drainage or buffer, what the term that you used. So and I, I, you made a good point. The, the issue here tonight has nothing to do with the drainage issue. It has to do with the 20-foot undisturbed buffer that probably, as the chairman said, was a requirement that the board put on the development in Spivey, the name of the subdivision, Spivey. Taylor, Taylor's, Landing. Taylor's Landing. Taylor's Landing. To protect the people like you who lived in the RA property adjoining the subdivision. So it was, it was a requirement that was put on the subdivision, not the other way around. I was the owner of the property when it was sold. Sorry, I can't hear you, sir. Oh, I could you step owner. to the microphone? I was the owner of the property when it was sold, and uh, they put this 30 feet bumper in there. I was the owner of the property. Mm -hmm. For the drainage, but now the 20 foot buffer, this board conditioned. conditioned the 20 foot to protect the people who lived outside the subdivision that was being proposed. So that's the 20 feet that we are considering tonight, not the drainage. Either. So we can, the board can vote, and so I know, Mr. Preston, you're coming into this new to remove, uh, to allow for the removal of the 20, but the 30 foot would still have to stay there. It could not be removed under the stormwater ordinance. Is that correct? Michael, I know you're, you're gesturing. Our environmental compliance department has been out and taken a look at this. They've looked at the site, and in my conversation with them, they're not sure as to why it was imposed, that 30 foot. Um, conveyance buffer. They've looked at it. I think that's what they shared with you as well, Sherry. Uh, you know, we should like to go back and take a look and see if there's a conveyance issue from the stormwater standpoint. I'm not sure if stormwater departments looked at it or not, um, because it didn't appear that there was a drainage conveyance. You can see along those the bottom two lots, um, or the top two lots rather. Yeah, you, you'll see on the plat itself, the 30-foot conveyance isn't on every single lot. But there's some here, I mean, some of the internal ones, I'm not sure how exactly where it's included, like right here, it, it stops here at this property line for whatever reason, and only the 20-foot picks up along in this area. Um, those along here, it is the full, you have the 20-foot undisturbed buffer here and the 30-foot undisturbed buffer here. And they weren't sure, when they went out and looked at the site, they weren't sure why, if this was conveying stormwater drainage or not. So I think that was one of their questions, and they wanted to, they wanted to take a closer look at. As sure. Sherry's noted, the issue right now, tonight, is being considered is this area between a property line and this initial 20 feet, between this initial 20-foot buffer area, the 30-foot buffer area picks up at the edge of the 20 and extends another 30 feet in this area. So you know, you'll see it depicted here. You'll see it depicted back along this backside. And again, back along here as well. Back in here in this area as well. Um, yes, sir. You have just pointed out exactly what these people have just said. You're going to have to eliminate, if you eliminate the 20 foot, which is next to the RA property, mm -hmm. You've got to go across the 30 feet to get, In order to get there. Sir? In order to get there. That's right. So, I mean, how can you eliminate a drainage buffer or a 30 foot undisturbed drainage buffer to eliminate 20 on the other side of it? And again, my understanding was that the intent was to be able to put a fence along the property line. 
I don't know if you can. Okay, I can understand that, but what, what's going to happen if that's a drainage, drainage easement, and they put a fence across it, or say a, a solid board fence? What's what, you got an obstruction to the to the drainage problem again? And I think the big question is, I prefer to Terry, um, is identifying exactly where that that stormwater conveyance channel is. Exactly. Making sure we nail that down. Exactly. <coughs> Y'all want me to make an educated guess as to why I think it's there? Because that's what it'll be. That's all we're doing. That's all we do. Might as well throw one more in. Part of water quality feature can be allowing water to go through certain types of vegetation to clean it up. Based on what this lady uh, tells me that water is going in the area that these are in, which makes sense that they were placed there, and that restriction was put there so you wouldn't put anything in there that would keep the water from flowing through those areas. For instance, a grass swale is actually a water quality improvement feature. So if I put that there and protected that, I don't want them putting hardscaping in there that would eliminate that natural buffering from plants and forest. You know, water sheet flowing through a forest is going to clean it up. That is a water quality type feature. So I suggest that that buffer there was placed there not as a zoning condition, but as part of meeting the stormwater requirements, water quality requirements. And yes, if that is put there to allow sheet flow to go through there, you put a fence up, you may have to require that that fence be picked up a little bit so leaves and vegetation and things like that won't accumulate like a chain link fence or a spigot, a picket fence, something like that to allow the water to go under it. So I think the two may be somewhat related. If you allow a fence, you may want to make sure that it allows for that conveyance to happen. Uh, there's probably, the reason it's probably not a zoning though, I suspect if you went through their stormwater design where they address the water quality features, you'll probably see that they put that there to meet those requirements. 30-foot buffer or 20-foot? Yes, foot? the 30-foot buffer. What about the 20-foot? 20 20-foot 20 is a buffer, like you said, is just a buffer of the properties. I think they put the 30-foot additional there probably for water quality reasons. But what Commissioner Holder has mentioned is that you have to get through the 30 to get to the 20. So if you put the hardscapes in, which leads me to, because now we've muddied this thing up, not to, to pick on the water that we've got, but we, we had the homeowners that lived within Taylor's Landing, I mean, we had tremendous participation. We had the staff that was putting to approve this. So this looked like a slam dunk, and now we're finding that there's water quality issues. What is the staff's recommendations with this new information now? Because we, we've been presented with something completely different. I don't have one. <laughs> I think you need to table yeah. this issue for stormwater and go exactly out and do a it. thorough that's review exactly of what. the site. Yeah. And that way they can come back and actually report and we can quit speculating because we're probably all wrong at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, we certainly don't want to do something that would take away that water quality exactly. item, increase flooding, block a floodway or, a, or something like that. And it may be that there is a win-win in this if... Uh, if, if that, I don't know if they have issues with the fence or not, but if the fence could be put up and we still could meet our water quality stuff, then I think you'd want to hear from Stormwater that we could do that Certainly. or satisfy that. So. Certainly. And also check and verify why the water's not getting back to the detention pond unless there's, you know, unless there's, I mean, it seems like that that's where it should be going. I mean. Well, again, if you, if you get into the stormwater design, they look at the total flows of the property. Read, there could be a ridge that said originally part of this water and this development went this way and part of it went that way. They may said they may have done what we'll do is address the runoff. We'll take most of the runoff and take it into the pond and reduce that flow and allow the other to go this way. The overall effect would be the same as post-development, prior development. So a lot of times, not all the water in a subdivision has to go through the pond to meet the water quality. Um, there's other ways to obtain it. And, and I don't know if that's the case or not, but we certainly can look at it 
from the design element and see if it's supposed to be getting in the pond. The, the ladies, I, I apologize because I don't remember which lady had the picture, but the picture appeared to be uh, very red stained, almost muddy water. So that doesn't appear to be going through vegetation and cleaning it up. That appears to be something else. Of a, I'm, I'm just, you know. Could be something going on in that 30 foot that ain't supposed to be going on as well. I don't know. Okay. Could be. Mike, let me ask you a question. Um, the number 15 lots, if there's a 20 foot buffer that's put on it as a condition on a, on a subdivision, <coughs> And you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to be able to fence that in? You're asking if they can fence it, fence it in? That's um, what they're talking about, about fencing it in. If this 30-foot wasn't there, around this 30-foot is just in that one area. If this 20-foot went away. Right. Correct. Because you're not supposed to be able to fence in that buffer, correct? No. No. On the on their side on their side if of the twenty foot on if, their ed, 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 on the if it's on the development side R A to R two mm -hmm. if it's stated in, as a condition of zoning that is to remain an undisturbed buffer and it's got Leland cypress planted in it right, right now are you supposed to be able to fence that in in lieu of the in lieu of the buffer no not in lieu of the buffer I mean in this case the condition was an undisturbed buffer so they'd have to come back and remove that condition in order to be able to do away with the they would not the be able to fence that in, right? Correct. No. It's yeah, it's undisturbed buffer. Do you know anywhere in the county that's happened? I suspect you probably do. <laughs> <laughs> First hand, the number 15, right beside me. Right. I'm thinking, and I've said all along, this was a condition of zoning that you're not supposed to be able to fence that in, and has not been enforced. So I'm wondering how they enforced it on. This development. So in that case, it was a condition to retain the absolute und undisturbed 15, 20 foot undisturbed buffer is not supposed to be contained right. in a house with a fence. Correct? Yeah. If it's undisturbed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> case dismissed. I just wanted He was to making a point for you. Yes, he was. And we've been out there many times. I'm sitting there going. Are you right? <coughs> All right, um, Mr. Preston, would you like to make a motion to table this item for future review? I, I would, because obviously water quality issues are very important to the county. But I do, I mean, the other, like I said, the homeowners that are involved with this within Taylor's Landing, obviously very organized. If you saw how the way it was written up, they've all agreed to split the cost of making this filing. So I want to make sure that at some point, you know, we give them their ability to, to, to make their, their comments felt and heard, certainly, too. Certainly, certainly. And I don't know if they want to make it tonight or if you want to wait until the stormwater review comes back. You do want to make it tonight? Wait okay. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That, that was it. I just wanted to I know that we never asked for the applicant to come forward, and yeah. some okay. of the property owners are present. Okay. If um, we will have stormwater come out to do a stormwater assessment, and um, they, if you will get your phone number, contact information to the clerk so that they can follow up with you and you can walk them over the property and show them the areas of concern. That would probably help them um, as they're doing their review of the site. Okay, thank you. All right, if um, at this time I'd like to call a representative of Taylor, the Taylor's Landing at Spivey Homeowners Association of Stockbridge to come forward. And if you could, sir, please state your name and address for the record. Uh, Madam Chairman. Good evening. Um, commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to stand before you. Hopefully, oh, first of all, my name is Dion Reed. I represent uh, the 15 residents of Taylor's Landing as the secretary of the Homeowners Association Board. Um, I'm um, also like to state that uh, as the gentleman stated, that uh, we had 100% uh, uh, participation and support of the application of the 15 residents of uh, Taylor's Landing, and I have a small representation of the uh, community. You guys, that's just cute to stand uh, with me. Um, and I hope my brief presentation um, goes in our favor to, to dispel the, the whole 
technical water, stream water, fault ro rollout and the whole, all of that. Uh, the picture that was presented, uh, I can speculate that the, the picture that was presented was prior to the full development of the community uh, before the sod was actually laid. I was in, I was one of the first uh, residents of the community and I know, n know that day in particular because it was, uh, the, 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 the land had just been, the, the soil had just been um, uh, d developed, I guess, before they put the sod, before they laid the sod, so it was a bad storm and all that red mud rolled down to my neighbors and I do sympathize and, and uh, for their cause at that point in time, but since the sod has been laid, I don't think they've experienced any more of that uh, type of, uh, uh, um, that, that was illustrated here earlier. Um, this is uh, uh, to us a, a simple matter of uh, full use and enjoyment of our property. Um, the property, the, the buffers in question are on our property. Um, the, the, the also the buffers in question are just ugly, nasty <coughs> growth that produce wildlife. Um, I have a grand, I have a, a three-year-old grandkid. I've, I've killed several snakes in my backyard because of this. Um, um, I, I do believe that a fence would enhance um, my property for full use and enjoyment, and all the while uh, preventing whatever my neighbor's concerns are uh, for um, if it's the red mud uh, that they're concerned about, uh, there will be sodded and, and landscaped, and, and uh, I like to consider myself an aficionado in landscaping and so forth, but that's neither here nor there. Right now, I just have a bunch of uh, wildlife that, that that's in my backyard that needs to be trimmed, pruned, cut. Uh, I wanna I wanna put a, put roses and knock out roses and flower beds and things of that nature. Um, I have a very unique uh, property uh, where where only a certain portion of that 30 foot it, it kind of if I put a fence up I, I would have to kind of do a zigzag around my yard. I mean I could illustrate it, uh, but my neighbor uh, he he actually is losing two of my neighbors that are here today are actually losing 50 feet of their property to uh, this runoff uh, to this uh, these, these buffers um, um, from from what I understand in my research the 30 foot buffer um, was considered I think once upon a time a, a, a pickup truck trail and, and you can even almost see the the tire lanes that so so much for the the, the, uh, the water quality and also in my research I, I uh, learned through uh, Henry County that um, there's no lakes or whatever for the water qu the water quality buffer to even exist so why why is there and it's still a mystery no one knows um, I'm ready to I'm ready to, to, to landscape my yard. I'm ready to become a, a, a full use backyard. Uh, we, me and my family, we're backyardigans. We're out barbecuing all the time, but right now we're, we're isolated to a very small portion of our yard due to this uh, this buffer. And quite frankly, uh, I, I don't know why it's on the rest of the property, but I understood that I, you know, we had to represent the entire community in order for me to have a full use and enjoyment of my property. So. Uh, that's why we got together as a community and, and presented our application to you. And, and, uh, and that's basically what this boils down to, full use and enjoyment of our property. Can I ask you to look over and point out where your lot is on that map? Okay. Uh, let's see. I got a weird um, Okay, I'm here. Okay, and... And uh, you can see that's that little corner, that 30 right there. And my fence will come here, cut in about, I think about another 20 feet, then go over 30 before it hits the 20 foot buffer, and then come back down. And, and yeah, so I kind of got a weird L shape. So there's the 30, and it kind of stops a little, about, about 10 or 15 feet. That's probably 15 feet, and then go in. And, and then hits the 20, and then comes back out, and and, and, uh, and then that, this is my neighbor's lot, uh, Michael, that's sitting over here. He he loses the entire 30 and 20, and so is Antoine 30 and 20. But but to have the, the 20 around the rest of the that that doesn't support the the, the 
again, I sympathize with my neighbors when the red clay ran into their yard, but I, I understood that we cannot have a, uh, uh, submit an application for one lot. It has to be um, for the entire lot. So the rest of my neighbors, the other 12 neighbors, they're, they're uh, collateral damage or, or victims of circumstance. So, uh, so I'm here representing the, the community at large. I don't know what the other 20 represents. And if they get it off, then I need it off. Or if I get it off, they, it, it, that kind of, I'm not familiar with that. And I don't know how that works here. But. Can I, just out of curiosity, when did you purchase a house already built or did you buy a lot and have your home built? Uh, the, uh, the, it was a, a spec neighborhood. A spec, uh, they, they built 15 lots, and, and so my lot was built after purchase. It was already purchase. built when you it purchased it? It was built after, after purchase. What year was that? Uh, we, we hadn't been there two years yet. Two I, years? The whole subdivision is probably not two years old. When you purchased your home, did, did the seller bother to tell you that there was an undisturbed buffer on your property? Did they even disclose that to you? Uh, there was mention of a buffer. Uh, undisturbed, my, my, uh, my limited knowledge, uh, had no idea what that meant. My neighbor, um, you also referred to, you know, that's a buffer, you, you, that's a buffer. So I, I learned, since learned, that uh, I didn't know if that buffer split our property, 10 was on his, 10 was on mine, and uh, through, through, through uh, matter of fact, uh, I think the gentleman stated I was in the process of erecting a fence when I learned, got very educated on the entire situation. And, and uh, when uh, petitioning my neighbors, um, I would say maybe three of the 15 heard about the buffer and the others didn't know about it and what, you know, what, so it, our education probably got, uh, lack of education probably got us uh, into the mess we're in today. Uh, but uh, I did cease uh, uh, the uh, building of the fence and uh, until the, the, the hopefully positive uh, outcome of the board tonight. <laughs> uh, and and uh, can I answer any other questions for you? Trump, the, the ULDC? Yes, sir. The conditions run with the property. Okay. So in this case, it would trump the Unified Land Development Code. Mr. Preston. Mr. Reed, I really appreciate you guys. I guess I think I've given you all compliments two or three times now on being organized and putting everything together. And I had full intention of, of placing a recommendation on the floor for the other commissioners to look at, but you can understand water quality is very important. And I'm not, this is not a no, but I think we are. The prudent thing is just for water quality standards, because you know how environmental things are these in this day and time, doesn't mean that you're not heard. It just means we might have to table this, get some answers for some, from some individuals to tell us where we can proceed without causing problems to the groundwater as well as the environment. But so we're, unfortunately, we're probably going to have to table this. Um, but I do appreciate what y'all have done here, and, that, and that's that's not a no. It just means we need more information. The county is under federal mandate. Um, all counties are to manage stormwater appropriately and so we have stormwater ordinances that are in place that govern development throughout the county um, commercial and residential and so in order to assure that we're not violating any of the federal mandates or our adopted stormwater ordinances we need our stormwater department to come out and do an evaluation pull the file and look and find out why I'm curious about the 30 foot I understand the 20 foot because when this subdivision was rezoned it was abutting um, a lot of RA zoned property and back during the height of the zone of all the zoning and building going on in Henry County which we probably wish we could see more of today now that we don't have it um, there was a lot of pressure from residents who had been here for a long period of time they didn't want subdivisions abutting their residential agriculturally zoned properties and so many of these buffers were, were put in as Mr. Stamey can tell you because he lives next door to one now in order to protect those homeowners and the, the use of their residential agriculturally zoned property. So the 20 I understand, the 30 I don't. It doesn't make sense. And so that's why we probably need to investigate this a little bit more and find out what that's doing there and why, how that ended up there because that's something I haven't seen on any plat in this county. So um, 
until we can get those answers, we, we're really going to have to table this issue and bring it back as quickly as we can. Our stormwater department can get out there probably within the next couple of days, correct, Mr. Arletta? And uh, start reviewing that and then get some answers to us, and we'll get it back on the agenda as quickly as possible. What we can do, um, this is a public hearing, and so we will count this as the public hearing. We'll table it to delay action until the next meeting so it doesn't have to be re-advertised as a public hearing and we can bring it back up as soon as the stormwater department does that <coughs> which our next meeting will be in two weeks so that will be the earliest we could get it back before the board I understand. yeah if it's an evening meeting it'll be a month um, it'll be a month i could yield the rest of my time to the, the community michael antoine well, we'd, be, we'd certainly be glad to hear them, but I don't think it's going to change. I mean, we'd be glad to hear them if they'd like to add some comments. We understand what you're saying, but we've got to resolve why that 30-foot buffer was put in there by um, the stormwater department. I don't, I, we don't understand why it's there. But if, if, if they would like to comment, we'll certainly have several minutes left. We'd love to hear from you. Okay. Yes, sir. If you would, to the microphone, please. And state your, if you could state your name and address for the record. Good evening. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, good evening, uh, Board of Commissioners. My name is Antoine Dugan. Uh, I'm a current resident on Lot 15, as was said. Uh, we definitely appreciate you guys looking into this situation because, with all due respect, we do value our neighbor safety and we do value their properties. So it kind of behooves us to be very diligent along with them to one, protect their properties and two, to get the full use of our properties. We would, we would like that, but not at their detriment. So we just want to say we do appreciate you guys looking into it. And uh, we look forward to the decision and hopefully it will be something that we can both uh, be satisfied with. Okay. Thank appreciate you. It. Thank you. All right, Mr. Preston, I'll look to you to make a motion. I'm going to make a motion that we table this until we get the, the groundwater issue resolved and get clarification on that 30-foot buffer and present it at – did, did y'all say you had a preference for two weeks or a month? Did y'all want to be here for the evening meeting or did you want to – As expedient as possible. Okay, so in the next two weeks if, if possible. Okay. We have a motion uh, by Mr. Preston and a second by Mr. Holmes. If there's no further um, comment from the board, all in favor? Okay, motion carries 5-0. Thank you. The next item on the agenda, of course, that is, um, we have tabled that one. We're going to move to public comment at this time. And this is where citizens are allowed to voice county-related concerns, opinions, etc that are not listed on the agenda during this portion of the meeting. All persons wishing to speak for public comment must sign in with the county clerk prior to the beginning of the meeting. We have one gentleman who has signed up for public comment, Mr. R. Pierian uh, of 602 Arlington Circle in Jonesboro, and he is here to speak on a historic zoning matter of concern. And Mr. R. Pierian, if you would, please step to the microphone. You have five minutes. Several of us are going to be aware of what you're speaking on, but not aware of what has transpired I, recently. I am going to be very brief. I'm not going to relive history. <laughs> um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My purpose for addressing the 2012 board is to request them to acknowledge the decisions made by the 2006 board at its January 17, 2006 meeting. Chairman Mathis, Commissioner Stamey, and Holder participated in that meeting, as did uh, Ms. Sherry Matthews of Planning and Zoning. As recorded in the minutes of that meeting, a rezoning request by BK Builders resulted in the County Commission granting a change from R2 to C1 with a lengthy list of restrictions within the C1 category to permit a strip mall at 3359 Jodico Road in District 2. The restrictions were written into the record not to prevent some future political mischief, 
Rather, all the documentation showed that for the purpose of environmental health, the capacity of the septic system at 3359 Jodico Road was restricted to its design capacity of 1,250 gallons, barely adequate for the 6,000 square foot office building for which it was designed and approved. That building morphed into the strip mall by the time of the January 17, 2006 commissioners meeting. It was and is in the record that there is no land on that lot available to expand the septic system. So it was written that among the list of other con uh, consumers of volumes of water, a hair salon could not occupy space within the strip mall. BK Builders eventually went bankrupt. The county assessor lists a new owner as of January 2011. I wasn't aware of this until about a week ago when all of this rock got kicked over. Within the last two weeks, a storefront church, a hair salon, and a gift shop have gone into business at the strip mall. My concern is that the administrative device that was used in 2006, i.e. the owner proceeded because a clerk in the county office made a determination of the zoning classification without full knowledge, will again be used. If we assume that the current owner has been provided a certificate of occupancy by a clerk for a hair salon, church, etc., based upon the definition of a C1 category without knowledge of the imposed restrictions, the new owner could reasonably argue the county to override the restrictions. Lurking underground, however, but above the grade of the surrounding residential properties is a septic system that cannot accommodate more than 1,250 gallons. This lot is approximately 200 yards downhill to Lake Jodico. Um, I'm finished with my prepared comments. In the interval, I, the uh, county attorney has contacted me, and uh, the uh, Sherry Matthews and I have spoken. I guess they're going to proceed uh, with this. I apologize to the new commissioner for District 2. I didn't want to dump this in your lap. I mean, you, you don't want to touch this one. <laughs> Believe it or not, that one got dumped in my lap my first few months in office as well. So there seems to be a official initiation here. then. <laughs> but um, as, you, as you were probably aware, the tax commissioner's office is the one who issues licenses to businesses. and. For some reason, there's some kind of disconnect there, and I, I don't know what it is. I'm not but saying a certificate's been issued. Nobody knows. Okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna check on that because I remember the zoning and I remember the issues. And if if that septic system cannot accommodate those types of businesses, those types of businesses can't well, go in there. That's a public health. To refresh issue. your memory, that building was designed, everything was approved to be an office building. Correct. And then after That's the correct. fact, oh, why don't we have a strip mall? But exactly. that didn't change what's underground. Ex you're exactly right. And uh, Would we... Would somebody keep me aware? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you for bringing that to our attention because unless you're driving by there and unless you're familiar with what's going on, there's no way we would know. Thank you for com and coming in and bringing this to our attention, and we will certainly look into that immediately. Thank you. Thank you. And we will keep you posted. Mr. County Manager, anything for public session? No, ma'am. Ms. County Attorney? No, ma'am. Upcoming meetings and events, Monday, April 30th at 9 a.m., we have our workshop meeting. Tuesday, May the 1st at 9 a.m., a regular commission meeting. 
Monday, May 14th at 9 a.m., and Tuesday, May 15th at 6.30 p.m. These are both regular board meetings. If there's no further business to come before the board, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Holder, second by Mr. Preston. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. We stand adjourned.